Wikipedia describes Homer Simpson as a comedian and actor, known for portraying a semi-fictionalized version of himself on the sitcom The Simpsons. But in reality, this barely scratches the surface. Since his initial foray into the film industry in the early 1930s, Simpson has carved out for himself one of the most illustrious and colorful careers in Hollywood history. This is his story. Coming to you from beautiful downtown Fortitude Valley, it's the Harry Gold Show, with your host, Harry Gold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the program. This week's presentation is a documentary about the career of acclaimed Hollywood actor Homer J. Simpson, narrated by yours truly. I hope you enjoy it. In April of 1923, the wife of a Polish carpenter in South Bucket, Oregon, gave birth to a son, her 11th child, Hyman Stankiewicz. In an unwitting act of thespic cliché, Hyman first exhibited an interest in acting at William H. Boring Elementary when taking part in school plays such as Romeo and Juliet, Pirates of Penzance, and a musical adaptation of The Castle by Franz Kafka. Despite being the son of a humble carpenter, Hyman was able to break into Hollywood's highly competitive movie industry at a young age through diligent persistence, mesmerizing charisma, and a helping hand from his loving mother, who happened to be a casting director at Paramount Studios. A director named Max Fleischer took a liking to young Hyman, but insisted on changing his name to something easier to spell and less likely to be kept out of a country club. Simpson later revealed in his autobiography, American Yellow, that his initial intention was to call himself Herman J. Stanko, but found out there was already an actor at Warner's by that name. Hyman was convinced by Fleischer to use the stage name Homer Simpson, which Fleischer thought would help solidify his image as an intellectual. Working for Max Fleischer, Homer began his career in motion pictures as a featured extra and bit player in comedic short subjects, appearing alongside industry giants of the period like Clifton Birch, who famously portrayed Popeye the Sailor Man, and the singer and comedian Betty Boop. It wasn't until the 1940s, when colour film became commonplace, that Homer started running into trouble with his unique complexion. In black and white, his bright saffron skin was indistinguishable from any other flesh tone. But in Technicolor, his impressionistic hue stood out from his contemporaries. Nonetheless, Homer forged ahead, overcoming the industry's prejudices by giving standout performances, showing off an unparalleled work ethic, and still having a mother who worked as a highly paid casting director at a major Hollywood film studio. He expanded out from Fleischer Studios and started to get work elsewhere, including appearing as a disembodied pair of legs alongside Thomas Rafferty and Jerry Howard in a Tom and Jerry short, Throughout the decade, Homer was afforded opportunities to work with many of the industry's leading comedic talents, including Jack Powell, the second and current actor to play Mickey Mouse, as well as Donald Benning, Mel Katz, T.H. Pracy, and many others. Through observing them, Homer honed his craft and began to perfect the comic sensibilities which would later culminate in his meteoric rise to stardom. The 1950s brought with it the dawn of television in the popular consciousness, and with it a variety of opportunities for Homer. He formed a strong working relationship with Bill Hanna and Joseph Barbera, who had split off from MGM and formed their own studio, and were responsible for hit primetime sitcoms like The Flintstones and The Jetsons. This would help Homer's career greatly over the following decades. Throughout the 1960s, Homer's star only continued to rise, he was in enough demand that he started to get overseas work, especially in Japan. This time abroad would later inspire episodes of his sitcom, including the famous Mr. Sparkle episode, based on a real incident with a logo bearing his likeness. Homer's career was coming along nicely, and he was doing well for himself financially. However, he still continued to play one-off character roles and cameos in television, along with the occasional bit part in a movie. He still found himself unable to crack into the major roles he had always dreamed of as an aspiring youth. In 1972, Homer married longtime friend Marsha Day, who he had met on the set of The Flintstones where she portrayed Betty Rubble. Things were going well in Homer's private life as well as in his career. Though not yet on top of his field, he was proverbially on top of the world. But this was all about to come crashing down. 
In 1978, Marsha Day found out Homer had had an affair with actress and musician Susanna Yates, best known for her role in the Hip to be a Square sequence from children's program Sesame Street. Homer had met Susanna through mutual acquaintance Kermit the Frog at one of Jack Nicholson's infamous Hollywood parties. Though the fling had been brief and was fueled almost exclusively by an enormous intake of illicit substances, Susanna Yates had become pregnant by Homer. On July 23rd, she gave birth to his illegitimate son, Robert Simpson. Marsha left Homer over this, and a month later he married Susanna, making her the new Mrs. Susanna Simpson. Their friends and associates did not take this well, and Marsha had friends in high places. Hanna-Barbera blacklisted Homer from working on their productions, and others quietly followed suit. Work had suddenly dried up for Homer Simpson. Incidentally, his mother had also just retired as a casting director. He was only able to get the occasional walk-on by pulling in favours or going under the pseudonym Max Power. After being in the business for decades, not only had hitting the big time eluded Homer, but now even getting by was a struggle. But little did he realise the 1980s were to be a turning point. In the middle of the decade, Homer met writer and humorist Matt Groening at an LA bar, and struck up a friendship over a mutual distaste for people who don't know how to pronounce their surname. When James L. Brooks tapped Groening to create a series of sketches for an upcoming television program starring English comedian Tracy Ullman, Groening immediately thought of Homer and sought to cast him essentially as himself. Groening created The Simpson Family, inspired by a merging of Homer's family anecdotes as well as his own childhood. They wanted to base the son on Homer's son Robert, but they thought calling him Bert was too obvious, so Groening changed it to Bart Simpson. Stand-up comedian Marjorie Nadler was cast as Homer's TV wife, with Matthew Tenney and Margot Burns portraying his children. Twins Jody and Sabrina Marcus were cast as the youngest sibling, Maggie. On April 5th, 1987, The Tracy Ullman Show launched, and the sketches featuring The Simpsons were a smash hit. The network thought they could work in their own full-length sitcom, and on the 17th of December, 1989, The Simpsons debuted its first episode, Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire, and the rest, is history. Homer kicked off a spate of stand-up comedians playing semi-fictionalized versions of themselves in sitcoms, like Family Guy and King of the Hill. He toppled the Greek philosopher as the world's most famous Homer. He made great strides in representation for lemon-hued entertainers, along with early pioneers like Bertram Green, half of the famous comedy duo Bert and Ernie, and innovators like Irving Pack, better known by his stage name Pac-Man, which eventually made way for later A-list acts like the Finley Brothers, Jaden Powell, John Darrell Blake, Lee Werther, and even his own son Robert Simpson, who went on to capitalise on his resemblance to his father, as well as his mother, premiering his own hit television sitcom in 1999. Homer Simpson's career is long and storied. The number of lives it has affected is innumerable, and his star shines bright even to the present. Truly this was Homer's Odyssey. Let's play a game. I'll draw someone famous, and the first person to guess who it is in the comments gets a shout out next week when I tell you the answer. If your guest last week was I'm something of a green goblin myself, aka Willem Dafoe, you were absolutely correct. The first person to get that right was Danny Nolan. Well done Danny, and thanks for playing everyone. The eyes on this week's subject are diminutive and squinty like a freshly made puppy, and slope down towards the bridge of a substantial nose which is borderline aquiline. Travelling down past an expansive upper lip, we arrive at a mouth and chin which is getting so lumpy one will soon require a jeep wrangler to traverse it. Their cheeks are as sunken as a souffle in a seismic shock, so you needn't worry if you don't know how to pronounce C-H-E-E-K-B-O-N-E-S. They are well and truly pronounced enough already. This person's bespeckled dome piece comes to a distinct point, resulting in a look that just begs to be fried sunny side up. Overall, their silhouette calls to mind a bust of Julius Caesar, or perhaps the girl from Dirty Dancing wearing a swimming cap. Now who could this be? Well, I hope you found that entertaining and informative. If you enjoyed it, perhaps hit the subscribe button, and more fun stuff like that will come your way soon. For this has been The Harry Gold Show. So until next time, stay safe, and God bless.